I, I think we've got enough people. We should try and start a couple minutes early, um, maybe recover a little bit of time. So uh, we're going we're gonna to start with uh, four talks on security of machine learning. Uh, John's going to gonna start us off. So you'll, you'll see the more the non-crypto papers are better at naming their papers. They do cool things like TMI. <laughs> um, and I have not figured out how to actually name my papers in cool ways. But uh, go ahead. John, let's, let's start us off and we can get going. All right, great, thank you. Um, so hi everyone, uh, I'm John, and uh, today I'm gonna be talking about uh, some of our work on uh, membership inference attacks on fine-tuned machine learning models. And this is based on joint work with my collaborator, Stanley Wu, who's uh, now at the University of Chicago, and our advisors at Northeastern, Alina Opre and Jonathan Ullman. So consider a typical machine learning setting where there's uh, some training data set D that's used to train some machine learning model uh, that we'll call F. And individuals can uh, interact with the model uh, via query access, where they can send data to the model and then receive some kind of response, like a prediction vector. Um, but now suppose that this individual is actually an adversary who wants to extract some information from the model F about the training data set. So there's tons of prior work in this area. Uh, one such example um, are attribute inference attacks, where the adversary is given some incomplete feature vector and um, uses their query access to the model to complete the missing, uh, the missing features. Another example is training data extraction and reconstruction attacks, uh, where the adversary uses both the like, query access and maybe some additional knowledge of, of the model to actually uh, extract or reconstruct the training data. So they're actually getting back samples from uh, this training set D. Um, and what we'll be talking about in this presentation are membership inference attacks, which are kind of much more fundamental uh, form of privacy leakage, as you'll see later, um, where the adversary is given some data point and then has to determine whether the data point was included in the training data set D or not. Uh, so the general strategy for these attacks, uh, at least on machine learning models, is that the adversary is given query access to the model um, and some point that we'll call the challenge point. Uh, they'll query the model on this challenge point, and whatever they get back is a response, usually like a, a prediction vector. Uh, they'll use this as some test, uh, test statistic to determine whether or not the challenge point, uh, or whether the challenge point was in the training data set, which will denote as in, or not in the training data set, which will denote as out. So uh, before motivating our work, uh, we need kind of these two important pieces of background, namely uh, differential privacy and transforming. So uh, differential privacy is a framework for protecting sensitive data that still allows us to do statistical computations. Um, and we'll define DP as the following. So we'll say that a randomized algorithm M is epsilon differentially private if for any two neighboring data sets, so for any data sets that differ on at most one individual, uh, the distribution of outcomes are like e to the epsilon close. So they're only off by like this multiplicative factor. So more concretely, uh, this means that if epsilon is equal to 10, let's say, um, it's going to be very, very easy to distinguish if I ran the algorithm on data set X or X prime. But if epsilon is equal to 1, um, it's going to be much harder to distinguish between these two because they're only a factor of E away from each other. And the way that we typically satisfy uh, differential privacy in our algorithms is by adding noise proportional to what's called the sensitivity of the computation. Um, by the sensitivity, I mean the maximum possible scale of any given individual's contribution. So um, kind of the maximum amount that this neighboring individual can change the outcome of the computation. But this is a talk about machine learning. So uh, how do machine learning algorithms satisfy DP? Well, it's a pretty simple algorithm that's just a variant of gradient descent. All that we have to do uh, is clip the gradients so that they have a bounded norm or bounded amount of influence and then add Gaussian noise to kind of blur the contribution. So the algorithm is as follows. We'll take a gradient step, uh, clip it to have a bounded amount of influence, and then kind of perturb it in a random direction so that uh, the influence is kind of uh, blurred. And we'll just do this over and over again until convergence. Um, sorry. And uh, I should note that because we're adding noise uh, during this uh, differentially private training, uh, necessarily there's some kind of uh, trade-off between privacy and utility. And this is like very, very fundamental to differential privacy. So um, a particularly convenient way to think about DP was introduced by uh, Kairuz et al. in 2013. And uh, what they show is that there's a characterization of differential privacy in terms of uh, an adversary's ability to actually perform this membership inference attack. 
And uh, this work gives us these two bounds that directly relate uh, the balanced accuracy and the true positive rate um, of this membership inference adversary uh, to the privacy parameter in DP. Okay, and here on the right, uh, we can see the ROC curves that represent these upper bounds as a function of different values of epsilon. So, uh, kind of sidestepping now, uh, transfer learning is this really popular technique uh, that uh, has kind of emerged as models are becoming increasingly harder to train from scratch. Uh, so, when we first wrote this paper, GPT-3 was the state of the art. Now we have bigger models, but even GPT-3 has like 170 something billion parameters. Um, and fine tuning allows us to apply the power of models like GPT-3 uh, to many specific downstream tasks. Right, without training from scratch and without having to use our own computational resources. And in this project, uh, we'll consider two kinds of fine tuning. Uh, first, uh, final layer fine tuning or feature extraction, where we freeze uh, the majority of the weights and only fine tune the final layer. Um, and just full model fine tuning, where uh, a, sub a larger subset or all of the parameters are, are updated on some downstream task. So, now to kind of connect this with differential privacy. There's been a huge amount of, of recent work uh, that's proposed using fine tuning as a kind of uh, silver bullet solution to this privacy utility trade-off. Um, but as you'll see, this is, this is a trade-off that's like inherent to DP, so maybe these, these uh, like attempts aren't, aren't going to work. So these works are really trying to leverage public data to learn uh, generic features before we even uh, touch sensitive data. Um, but we asked the question in this work, is publicly accessible data always actually public? Right? So uh, consider the following thought experiment. Suppose that I'm a customer at some company that claims to use private machine learning, and this company uses some pre-trained model as their initialization and fine-tunes with a really, really strict privacy parameter, like epsilon equals 0 0.1. Then uh, I make the following query to this model. And for some reason, it outputs all this private information about me. So I have this reasonable expectation that my data should be protected because of the advertised privacy guarantee. Uh, but you know, if the model is privately tuned on my data, how could this happen? And the reason is because these public data sets are often scraped from the web or from user data, and they could contain duplicate records of this sensitive data. Um, and uh, because these, these data sets can exceed terabytes in size, so for example, I think GPT three had like a 45 terabyte data, uh, data set. Uh, it can be extremely hard to comb through them to make sure that there's no sensitive information. And uh, furthermore, the data that's contained in these sets can be published unintentionally and gathered from users without consent. Uh, so uh, one really prominent example of this was MIT's 80 million tiny images data set, uh, which was actually hosted for 10 years on the internet uh, before any sensitive information was discovered. Uh, to be in it. And furthermore, uh, companies use these or have their own proprietary web scrape data sets, such as Google's JFT 300, that they use to pre-train models that can be fine-tuned as a service uh, by enterprise customers. So uh, the two main research questions that we ask in this, in this work are when and to what extent do fine-tuned models leak information about pre-training data? So this is like in the non-differential uh, privacy setting. And two, uh, when we fine tune with differential privacy, do we actually like get what we expect? Or do we get the guarantee that we expect? Um, so because fine tuning adds a layer between the pre-training task and the query access that the adversary has, we need to slightly change the membership inference threat model and security game. So just to give an overview, um, there's some pre-training data set that's drawn from uh, the pre-training distribution. And it's used to, to train this model that we'll call G. And this is the model that we really want to extract information from. Um, but then some third party or you know, so one of these customers could fine tune uh, the model to produce, uh, to produce F, which is what the adversary is going to have query access to. So then uh, as the adversary, we could query this model F. Um, and the challenger, or the victim in this case, in like the security game, is going to flip a coin. If the coin lands on heads, um, they'll sample a point from the underlying distribution, so a point that's not actually in the training set. Um, if the coin lands on tails, they'll sample a point from the training set. And then they'll send this to the adversary, uh, and the adversary basically has to determine which like, side the coin landed on. 
So uh, to realize this, uh, this adversary, we create an attack called transfer membership inference. This is where the name TMI comes from. Uh, and it's a, it's a meta classifier based attack. So uh, I'll go through the algorithm now. Suppose that we're given a target model F and uh, some sampling access to the pre-training and fine-tuning data distributions. Uh, then we'll train and fine-tune shadow models that uh, either do or do not contain the target point to mimic the prediction behavior of uh, the victim. Uh, we'll aggregate the prediction vectors uh, from queries on these shadow models, and we'll label them zero or one uh, to denote whether the target point was in or out uh, with respect to that shadow model. Uh, next, we'll train some meta classifier on these labeled prediction vectors. We'll query f on the target point and then just make some kind of meta classification on the observed prediction vector. Right. So um, for our experimental setup, we have uh, these three these three pre-training tasks and a wide variety of fine-tuning tasks. And what we really want to see is is uh, how tasks with varying similarity to pre-training or tasks that preserve more or less information from, from the pre-training data, uh, like enable privacy leakage in the downstream, in the downstream model. And then uh, these are the, the model architectures that we use for the corresponding data sets. So um, in this first plot, uh, we have uh, an ROC curve on a log-log scale. So this shows us the true positive rates of our attack at very, very low false positive rates. And this red line represents uh, like the state-of-the-art membership inference attack being run directly on the pre-trained model. And the blue line represents our attack being run on the fine-tuned model, uh, but trying to extract information about the pre-training data. Okay, so you could think of this red line as kind of an upper bound on how well our attack can do. Uh, as you can see, we're, we're still able to uh, achieve like, you know, similar accuracy on, on membership inference, even though we have to kind of go through this intermediary. In the second example, uh, we, we consider models that were, uh, that were fine-tuned on a larger subset of parameters, so not just the final layer. And uh, because uh, we're updating these model parameters, data that appeared earlier in training might be forgotten, so uh, the, the attack success uh, starts to decrease, but we still get non-trivial accuracy. Uh, then we take the idea of, of full model fine-tuning to its limit by fine-tuning all the parameters on a completely irrelevant task. So we pre-train on CIFAR 100, which is this like 100 class classification task. And then we fine-tune on some like dog breed classification. And we see that um, even though this downstream task is completely irrelevant, some information about the pre-training set is still being preserved in the final model. So um, in this next experiment, we fine tune the final layer with differential privacy. Um, but I should note that in this case, there's, there's no overlap between the pre-training and fine tuning data sets. Um, so quite trivially, the, the privacy guarantee only applies to this fine tuning data set. And we get similar accuracy uh, in determining membership of the pre-training examples. Uh, but the, the example that motivated this, this paper in the first place is uh, what can go wrong when uh, the pre-training set and the fine-tuning set overlap. So the kind of punchline result is that any individuals who happen to be in this overlap don't get any privacy guarantee, um, even if they were promised it in fine-tuning. And uh, the reason that this happens is what I like to call just underestimation of sensitivity. So the gradients in, this in, this overlapping, uh, in these overlapping samples uh, were not clipped or perturbed. Uh, so the contribution of these users is not restricted. Um, and you can see that uh, the upper bound for membership inference success from the hypothesis testing example is this, uh, this green dashed line. And even in cases where our epsilon value is really low, like epsilon equals 0.5, our attack just completely clears uh, this upper bound. So I guess uh, to, to wrap things up, uh, as models are becoming increasingly difficult to train, transfer learning has emerged as this really popular technique. Um, and it's particularly popular for, uh, for differential privacy because of the privacy utility trade-off. So uh, the problem with these works is that they, they don't consider any of the privacy risks of, uh, associated with pre-training data. Um, and using our attack, we find that fine-tuned models, uh, in the case uh, when differential privacy is or isn't used, uh, leak membership of pre-training data. All right, thank you.
questions for, for John? I, I, I want to be interactive today. I know it's before noon, but, but question. Hi, John. Thanks for the great talk. Um, quick question. So do, is the implication here that in order to um, have the, the, the promise of privacy, you have to essentially have a big time disclaimer saying, we can't guarantee this if you're, if you're already in the data yeah. before we did this? Yeah, I guess the, the real upshot is that like we should be more careful about what's included in the pre-training data sets, right? So like, yeah, there should be disclaimers that basically say if you happen to be in like a data breach that was web scraped, right, your data still might be compromised even though we're using DP in the like fine tuning step. Yeah. Hey, thanks. Anyone? Anyone else? So I'll, I'll just follow up on that. Aren't we too late? <laughs> I guess. <laughs> no, like, what, yeah. what, what can we do, right? Because we can't advocate for, oh, like, please use differential privacy when training new models because, like, no one is training models from scratch anymore. And nobody even know like, there's models where we don't know what was in, what was used to train them anymore. So, mm -hmm. like, what do I do? Like, yeah, can I've I seen... increase the noise? Like, yeah. So uh, I've seen some examples where... Uh, like researchers have tried to just create really, really sterile uh, pre-training data sets, either from these like generic, you know, uh, like they, they'll take a data set where the goal is just to learn edges, let's say, in a, you know, like a vision task, and then uh, pre-train on that and then fine tune on a sensitive task. And in these cases, like, you know, everything is still fine. Um, or let's say if you are dealing with text data, maybe you just pre-train on a ton of expert knowledge like textbooks, right? And, Hopefully, textbooks don't leak anything about uh, you know anything about individu individuals. Um, so I think the prescription should be kind of similar to that, right? Like you should just be more careful about what you use in pre-training because it could affect uh, the privacy of people in the downstream task. So maybe it is too late though <laughs> for things like GPT. Yeah, we're, we're positive, okay. <laughs> but we'll be positive. Yeah. yeah. Oh, only if nobody else asks another minute. Go ahead, Sherry. We're, we're on time for another minute or two. So, so a follow-up to that fascinating discussion it, it, is that does that imply that if you we use your sort of approach for attack, can we essentially recreate the membership of the pre-training data? Uh, or is that not going to be... Uh, you, you, you can't necessarily know... If it's in the pre, can you use this like in reverse to say to figure out what was in the pre-training data? The the reason I ask is because we've got you know seventeen lawsuits right now about copyright uh, you know content with all these authors and you know uh, artists claiming that their copyright was violated and not fair use. If you can prove that they were actually used, but the problem is it's very hard for them to make that case. So is there something here that we could use to? Sort of leverage that to say, hey, according to this attack, my data was in pre-training data. Therefore, OpenAI violated my copyright. Yeah, I, I suppose that you could use uh, attacks like this to to kind of verify whether or not um, you know some copyrighted data was in pre-training. Uh, I think the the caveat is that we have to fix some false positive rate, so we allow for some like kind of false accusations, right? So. Uh, the answer is yes, up to some parameter of the false of the false positive rate. Awesome, thanks. Great. Great. Thanks Thank very you. much, John. Hi everyone. Uh, today I'll be talking about uh, improving privacy attacks using data poisoning. So this talk will comprise of two of my most recent projects that I've worked on. So in the past couple of years, we have seen uh, researchers trying to uh, analyze trained machine learning models to understand uh, its privacy leakage. This is an important problem to look at because uh, organizations these days collect uh, data from their users to train their machine learning models and then later provide it as a service uh, to the public. 
So uh, if these attacks end up working, that means it's uh, inherently violating the privacy of the underlying users. So the most common types of uh, privacy attacks that we see uh, in the literature uh, are membership inference attacks, property uh, attribute inference attacks, and property inference attacks. In fact, in the last two-ish years itself, what we have seen is that if you are able to manipulate a small fraction of the training data, then uh, you could further amplify the privacy leakage of these underlying users. And uh, we propose one such attack called Chameleon, uh, where uh, the threat model is as follows. So an adversary is interested in knowing if a particular point x comma y is present in the training set or not. So towards this, the adversary cooks up some poison data and attaches it to the existing training data. Then the organization trains a model on this combined data and uh, provides a black box query access to the adversary. So the now adversary can query this black box model and get back predictions. So the predictions are usually one of two forms. Either you get back model confidences on each of the label or you just get back the predicted label. In uh, our work, we focus only on the predicted label. So, uh, so in order to understand the success of the adversary, it's usually measured in terms of how uh, high can uh, the adver how high TPR can the adversary achieve at a fixed uh, low false positive regime. So in this case, uh, a true positive is where the adversary says, "Hey, the point x comma y is indeed uh, present in the training set, uh, given that the point was actually in the training set." And a false positive would be where the adversary predicts the training point, uh, predicts the point to be in the training set while it was not actually present in the training set. So uh, uh, previous works have tried to tackle this problem where the latest work uh, called the decision boundary attack tries to uh, determine the membership status of a point by trying to figure out its distance from the decision boundary. This approach, however, is very computationally expensive and also requires uh, uh, requiring close to 2000 queries uh, by the adversary to query the target model. However, what we uh, realize is that uh, these existing label-only membership attacks, uh, they tend to fail in this low-false positive regime. So consequently, we try to figure out, uh, come up with a new attack, which is called chameleon here, that uses adaptive poisoning to succeed in the low-false positive regime. Uh, we, um, we empirically show that our attack uh, gets much higher TPR than prior works while requiring much fewer queries. We also provide a theoretical analysis to understand how does poisoning impact, the, uh, um, impact our membership inference attack. So let's talk about some insights uh, of our work. Say if uh, there was no poisoning, then uh, if there were two models, uh, regardless of the point present in the training set or not, both of these trained models would uh, very high, highly likely correctly classify this point. And say if we ended up poisoning too much, then what would happen is both of these in and out models here will uh, highly likely misclassify the point of interest. So the idea would be to add enough poison points so that uh, the in model actually still is able to correctly classify this challenge point while the out model misclassifies this challenge point. But the observation we make here is that each point that the adversary is actually interested in requires different number of poison points in order for the above condition to occur. And uh, also realize that if you query a single challenge point to the black box model, you'll just get back one label. But in order to amplify your attack success, what we could do is try to find neighbors around uh, this interested uh, in this challenge point and uh, use a combination of all of their labels to get a better attack success. So I won't go into the details of the uh, attack per se, but uh, uh, this is like a more uh, formal building blocks that could be used to construct our attack. 
So the first part is where you do the adaptive poisoning, whereas you add enough challenge points, sorry, enough poison points for each of the challenge so that you get the uh, previous condition. Then the next is that uh, when you construct this poisoning stage, you can reuse the machinery to actually also find the neighbors for that uh, given challenge point. And finally, once you have the neighbors and the actual point, you use them together to get back uh, a set of labels that can be then later used uh, for in order to determine the uh, membership status of that point. So how does it empirically look like? So we were able to, compared to prior works, we were able to achieve uh, as high as uh, 370 times better than uh, prior works in the true positive rates uh, at a false positive rate of 0.1%. And uh, we also additionally required much fewer queries where we required a 39x uh, query efficient than prior decision boundary attack. But uh, let's say what if the adversary was actually interested in um, figuring out some global properties of the training set rather than just uh, a single point. In this case, the threat model will look as follows. Say the adversary in this case is interested in knowing what fraction of people in the training set have lung cancer. So uh, towards this, the adversary cooks up another poison data set and attaches it to the training data. The organization then trains uh, a model on this combined data and provides a black box access to the adversary. The adversary can query the uh, model and get back predictions. In this case, we tackle both model confidence and uh, the only when you get labels, but I'll in for this talk, I'll focus on the model confidence version. Uh, the success of the adversary now changes to distinguishing between two given fractions of that target property. So for instance, here the adversary could be interested in knowing does the training data set have 0.1 fraction of people with lung cancer or 0.4% uh, 0.4 uh, fraction. So towards this, uh, we propose a new property inference attack called SNAP. Uh, which is able to have a higher attack accuracy uh, while being faster and requiring less poisoning than prior work. We also provide some theoretical framework to understand why our attack performs better. And we uh, propose various extensions such as uh, uh, where you get back only labels, which is the label only attack, property existence, what if the adversary is only interested in knowing that the property is even present in the data set or not and size estimation where the adversary is interested in knowing the exact size of that target property. Uh, we tested over uh, multiple properties and got high attack accuracy uh, at low poisoning rates. So here again, I'll go through the insights that we saw. Say you have two target fractions you are interested in T0 and T1. So what we observe is that uh, when you introduce poisoning, the distribution on these two fractions for the confidences uh, are disparately impacted. So before there was no poisoning, both the confidences uh, for fractions T0 and T1 were overlapping. So it's difficult to separate out uh, in which world uh, will you be in. But as you start to introduce poisoning in this, uh, the, uh, the distribution start to uh, start to vary, uh, start to vary. So poisoning in this case causes the causes a much higher class misclassification rate in the smaller fraction T0. And this uh, separation in confidences can then be used as our distinguishing tool. So I haven't talked about uh, what poisoning we use. We are using a poisoning attack called subpopulation poisoning uh, from prior work. And we also provide some theoretical analysis explaining why this uh, poisoning attack causes this separation in confidences in our paper. So uh, again, I'll just give a brief overview of these building blocks. So we have three blocks here. The first is data poisoning, where we launch that subpopulation poisoning uh, attack. Uh, followed by that, uh, this poisoning causes the uh, model confidence to separate. So we build uh, strategy on how to compute this threshold that would separate these two distributions and given this threshold now what the adversary do will do is just simply query the model and get back scores and uh, based on which side of the threshold it falls you can figure out which fraction you have. 
So there are multiple extensions uh, that we have proposed, but the one that I'm that I'll talk about here is the size estimation, which is a very realistic threat model because in practice the adversary may not always know what the target fraction is. The uh, observation we make here is that a uh, given uh, given poisoning is introduced, we see that the distribution follow a strict ordering. Uh, what it means is that if T zero is uh, smaller than T one then uh, the distribution of T0 will always fall to the right hand side of T1 and this follows for T2 and T3 as well. So now given that you have like a uh, strict size ordering, what you can uh, apply is binary search based approach and this can be then used to uh, figure out the target fraction T star. So prior approaches tried to uh, solve this problem before but required close to training uh, 20,000 models in order to get an estimate of T star. However, our observation here helps us uh, exponentially drop these number of models to as low as 14. So uh, in practice, how does this compare to prior work? So what we saw is that our model confidence version, version is able to achieve 34% uh, higher attack accuracy while being 56 times faster and requiring 4 to 6 times less poisoning than prior work. In fact, if we only had class labels, we, we were still able to outperform prior work while achieving the same efficiency benefits from uh, our confidence attack. Uh, and towards the uh, extensions that we have, the property existence recall that here you're interested in knowing if the property is even present in the training set or not. So here we get uh, attack accuracy of greater than 90% with uh, only 8 poison samples. And uh, our size estimation also we get pretty accurate estimations at uh, low falls, uh, at low poisoning rates. So in conclusion, we propose to uh, no, uh, pri privacy attacks that used poisoning to achieve a high attack success compared to prior works. And uh, we also provided some theoretical analysis explaining why, why our attacks were so effective. Uh, defending against privacy attacks is still a hard problem, especially for property inference. And uh, we were we empirically evaluated differential privacy and saw that it was not enough to prevent our attack. Thank you. Yeah, so uh, great talk, okay. So uh, uh, I mean, both uh, work are actually very interesting. So uh, I do have to follow follow question. So yep. the first one is that uh, you were talking about adapt adaptive poisoning, right? So uh, uh, from my experience, I feel that it's very difficult for the poisoning attacker to decide, uh, for example, the poisoning weight, right? So mm -hmm. Would you be able to talk about what kind of, of like a, the requirement right, on adaptive of, of being adaptive, right? And then the second one is that uh, given that uh, basically data poisoning attacks uh, are exploited for uh, facilitating this uh, membership or, or property inference attack, right? So uh, have you guys uh, uh, thought about that maybe there are already some like uh, defenses against poisoning attack, and then have you evaluated uh, the basically defenses against uh, poisoning attack, uh, whether uh, they will be effective for defending your attack? Yeah. Mm -hmm. So I guess I'll uh, answer the second question first and then go back to the first question. Uh, for the second question, uh, no, we, what we did was, uh, I guess what you're suggesting is like apply a defense on the poisoning stage first so that if you are able to filter out that poisoning, it might decrease the privacy yeah, yeah. Uh, attack stage. So no, I guess what we did was we directly applied defense on the final model itself. Uh, where you apply differential privacy while training, uh, but we didn't check for mitigating uh, poisoning in the previous stage itself. So probably, I guess, if you apply some sort of filtering-based approach in the beginning to cut down on the poisoning, 
maybe you could uh, it would indirectly reduce the uh, attack success of the final uh, privacy attack as well but uh, yeah i think that's it so uh, yeah yeah and uh, yeah in case of like the first question i guess um, just to be more clear i think what you are asking is like how does the adaptive poisoning kind of work yeah. probably so yeah i sort of uh, skip that part is uh, okay let me check if i have i, I guess i uh, to put it simple right so yeah. like uh, maybe you require a 1% data point anyway mm-hmm. then how the attacker can tell whether why not my poisoning samples are indeed 1% or 2% uh so what uh, towards that what happens essentially is the way we are doing it is uh, you iteratively do this process where uh, you kind of like don't have any poisoning to begin with and then you iteratively add a point poison point you check if there is a separation or not yeah and you But keep adding that i guess uh, then the problem becomes that poisoning attack is actually for training phase attack right yeah. and then membership inference attack is actually for testing phase yeah so and then as an attacker right so you will need to wait for the victim to change the model right and yes. then you'll be able to see whether your membership influence attack can succeed right yeah so, i mean there's a time gap yeah, yeah definitely so all of these poisoning attacks are during the training time and yes. then when once the model is trained is where you can actually launch your uh, attack yeah so yeah. that's why i have the confusion that, yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, Okay, right now I observe. For example, I I I poison the the training set, right? Mm-hmm. And then I I'll be able to observe that. Okay, so membership influence attack only improve one percent, mm-hmm. but that's not enough, right? Yeah. So, but I don't think there's another opportunity for the attacker to increase the poisoning weight. Mm-hmm. So, so I guess bec- you can probably do it locally, where you can keep testing this process, and once because there is this underlying assumption of the data distributions between the victim, like a common assumption in membership inference attacks are that the data set, uh, the underlying data distribution is known by the adversary, even if the data set is not known uh, to the adversary. Okay, so yeah. basically, uh, we need to assume that the attacker somehow be able to know the, uh, the. model they're going to attack. Yeah. Thank you. Mark. Oh, sorry. <laughs> I guess I, I was just yeah. going to ask about um so as an attacker do you have to know knowledge you have, you have to have knowledge as you're poisoning about what you want to gain in the future like do I need to know the target samples or I think is that the term like target symbols in the membership inference case like do I need to know what my goal is or is the attack versatile yeah i guess in membership inference usually the case is that uh, you know the point beforehand that you want to uh, test the uh, membership status of so that's usually the case okay okay going once okay great Hello everyone. Uh, today I am talking about the work, our recent work at several attacks on fundamental learning within in kind selection perspective. My name is uh, Sinuri. I am a second year PhD student from Umass Law, and this is a joint work with my colleagues and other researchers across from different institutions. I bet everyone have known the concept. In more like so, let's play a quick recap about this concept. Machine uh, fundamental learning is a popular machine learning paradigm that enables uh, remote clients to train a global model together without sharing the local data. In a training room, the server need to conduct client selection first and share the global model with them. After that, the clients will train the model locally. When the tra- uh, training finished. The clients will send the up model updates back to the server. Finally, the server will conduct the aggregation to update the global model. So in this work, we focus on client selection expert on uh fundamental learning. As you know, uh selecting required amount of clients is important for the success of performance of fundamental learning. So at here we just focus a very popular High selection strategy based on wireless channel information. 
uh, it aims to select top n kinds in total candidate, candidates pool to maximize the sum transmission rate. For example, we want to select uh, 10 kinds in 100 uh, candidates from the pool to maximize the uh, transmission rate. At the same time, we need to consider some practical constraints, including bandwidth, power, and others. As for the formulation, we focus on SINR, that is signal to interference plus noise. It is an important uh, factor related to the uh, CSI of our device. For a client, its channel gain is just from her own CSI signal. Other CSI and noise make up the interference. So the intuition behind this uh, client selection is very uh, simple. The server just uh, need to select clients with large channel gain and low interference. However, existing client selection works have not considered the vulnerabilities related to uh, CSI attacks. There are some pro uh, studies have proved that attacker is able to collect other kinds of CSI, and based on the collecting CSI, an attacker is able to uh, conduct some specific uh, attack. For example, as we can see from the figure, if an attacker uh, forge CSI with a large uh, channel gain and lower interference compared to others, and then it has more chance to be selected in next round. So based on this uh, issue, we just conduct a fresh study on kind selection security uh, based on kind of vinyl valid channel. We want to uh, explore the first question is that what are the vulnerabilities in kind selection on facility learning based on uh, valid channel. Our goal is to conduct a manual play manipulation on class selection results in a training room. To respond to these questions, uh, we designed the attack named Air Trojan. In the class selection manipulation part of Air Trojan, an attacker is able to accumulate other kinds of CSI, but it can only modify its own CSI. There are two attacks in uh, this part. In TDOS, an attacker is to uh, prevent victims from being selected in this round. To achieve this goal, an attacker needs to forge CSI with higher channel gain and lower interference compared uh, with the kinds. And for the collusion attacks, it aims to increase the conspirator selection probability in a round. So, and then the attacker need to conduct a similar cooperation to uh, forge CSI with large interference to big teams, but lower interference to a conspirator. And then we uh, want to uh, select some kinds in total, 100 kinds to observe how many times would the attacker will be selected in multiple rounds. In TDOS attacker, there are only one attack in the pool, candidate's pool, and there are two attackers, conspirator and the attacker together in the collusion attacks. As we can see from the uh, first row of table one, uh, even if the attacker says I uh, is not very good range, 20, uh, 20 to 100, it, it can able to use TDOS to manipulate the client selection results. But uh, if there are very big gap between the attacker and the conspirator, the collusion attack may fail. Uh, because as we mentioned before, uh, the attacker is, can only modify her own CSI, but not trading other CSI. So based on the first questions, we explore another interesting problem. How will uh, the attacks on class selection will impact the aggressive serial attacks? On fortnite learning. So in this part, we just uh, incorporate the uh, selection manipulation into adversarial attack, such as model poisoning. As you know, when once attacker was selected in this round, 
it can able to launch some poisoning attacks to make the model useless or make some uh, specific outputs. However, existing poisoning attacks set a default assumption that attacker always participate in each round. So we we are very interested to uh, explore whether this default assumption is the true case in real world practical class selection setting. As a result, we uh, integrate uh, original model poisoning and enhance uh, poisoning with TDOS and Clusion from our attacks under the practical kind of uh, selection to observe our air chosen impact on the adversarial attacks. To evaluate our, our attacks, we just set some high settings. There are uh, one or two attackers fixed in its training room, and there are uh, no fixed attacker aside, but there are 10% of total candidates in the pool. And the final two settings is our attacks, including TDOS and collusions. So our expectation is that we want to uh, observe that model poisoning perform well in the uh, fixed attacker participate in each round, but it may fail in the uh, real practical class selection setting. However, when uh, with the help of TDOS and collusion attacks, model poisoning performance comes back because a chosen can uh, ensure the class selection of uh, attackers. So we just uh, conduct some evaluation on uh, some common uh, aggregation and uh, two Antarctic and another two target attacks in this uh, class selection settings. As we can see from the table, and uh, the uh, fixed attacker participating in each round, the Kentucky model poisoning performed well because uh, attacker participate in each round, so it had chance to launch the model poisoning attacks. But when traced to the practical class selection setting, the performance tends to be less effective. However, with the help of TDOS and collusion uh, assistance, the Antaki model poisoning uh, go, goes up again. And we all, the evaluation on Antaki model poisoning share the similar results as the Antaki one. The attack success rate of poisonings is, uh, goes down in the view uh, class selection setting, but uh, with the help of air children, it, it boosts the success rate of target poisoning, which shows the effectiveness of a chosen to keep up the success rate of uh, model poisoning attacks. In conclusion, uh, this was the first study of uh, class selection security uh, based on valid channel information in fast data learning. We propose the a chosen attacks to conduct the class selection attacks, and based on this attack, we uh, demonstrate that. Uh, it can help to increase the risk of uh, poisoning attacks. In the future, we are working on robust defense in this field and then more uh, real world scenarios. Yeah, we are open for uh, collaboration and more discussion uh, later if you are interested. Thanks for your attention. I hope it's happy for questions. Yeah. I'll just start, which is, um, is the client selection mechanism like shared across different federated learning paths? Or are you going to have to redesign kind of the, the, the takeover tasks anew for every different federated learning architecture? Uh, yeah, we just uh, design our client selection based on uh, uh, formal works. Uh, High selection strategy based on the CSI uh, wireless channel, and uh, we just in integrate some new uh, algorithms in based on a formal box. So I, I guess my question is like for different for things that aren't channel selection yeah. learning tasks, how are clients picked? Do, like do you know is it 
do just report. Here's how much like I can change the model. Here's the like size of my gradient or like, right. How do you pick clients in, in other tasks? Uh, you mean uh, in the Valex setting? No, in, in other okay. settings. <laughs> okay. I, right, like, I can understand why this is how you do it in wireless. Okay. What do, you, do you know what you do in other settings? And the answer can be no. <laughs> I just don't know. Uh, so you want to integrate this work to another work? Yeah, <laughs> I think it's, uh, uh, because this uh, calculation strategy is based on Valex uh, information, but I can uh, integrate this uh, calculation strategy. Uh, for example, the CSI uh, forgery and the attacks on chi selection can be applied to another chi selection strategy. If uh, just, uh, it's more like um, a man in the middle attacks to uh, manipulate the chi result. Thanks for your question. Great. Thank, Thank you very much. You. Um, hello, I'm Hejin Zhang from Humus Amherst. And today I'm going to talk about federated unlearning. So it's the outline of my presentation. So before we get into the federated unlearning, we want, um, I want to introduce some background behind it, like the right to be forgotten or machine unlearning and federated learning as well, and the challenges in this um, framework. And it will be followed by some um, review and analysis of the federated unlearning techniques and concluded with my insights and future research direction. So um, there has there is a right to be forgotten. So it's it's the right to request a removal of their data when they ask to um, refuse to their privacy policy or something. But um, when it comes to the further um, I mean machine learning um, it also includes removing the influence of the model on the training data set. And to, the, to, the, to this end, um, the machine unlearning technique has been evolved. Um, the naive and the most um, accurate approach is to retrain the model from the scratch without the data to be forgotten, but it is infeasible due to you know, the time, memory, and resource overhead. And um, so it's a quick recap of further learning. It's a um, distributed machine learning framework that preserves data privacy by keeping the um, private training data on the local device. But um, this unique um, distributed nature brings um, challenges in further learning as well. So the data are distributed across the clients and the distribution is not known. So it brings the um, heterogeneous data, which is also called um, non-ID data. And in terms of client selection, so clients are selected um, arbitrary or like depending on um, the resource um, situation and everything. And it adds a layer of um, stochasticity of client selection. And the server and clients um, communicate the model parameter instead of the training data itself. So it brings an interactive training environment. And um, the, due to the different um, participating parties, the data accessibility is different. Um, varies across um, the participant. So the unlearning techniques um, explored in centralized setting is no longer um, trivially applicable. So um, we have reviewed 44 federated unlearning papers since 2020 to 2024, February 19th, and we analyzed them in three folds, system models, unlearning techniques, and evaluation metrics. 
And this is the basic um, overview or workflow of Feathered Unlearning. Um, unlearning could be happen like on the trained model, but it can happen along with the training. But let's say there's a feather to learn model and upon the removal request, the target, which are which could be sample class client or feature are removed first. And the influence embedded in the model is also removed, followed by performance recovery and how much how effective um, they forgot the data to be forgotten is evaluated through very variety of um, evaluation metric and finally the onward model is created but um so who unlearns under what data distribution it's who unlearns is important because the available knowledge is different from um, depending on who unlearns so for example um, as you can see on the um, left figure the, the the server or the target client initiates the unlearning the most because the server has um, all the history of local model parameters and the target client has its raw training data or um, information to be forgotten. And in terms of data distribution, this distributed environment brings um, a lot of um, importance in developing the method under non IID setting, but only 40, 54% of the words considered non IID setting. And there are um, multiple um, methods to simulate non IID setting, but um, it still remains as an emulation of non IID, but it doesn't, we can't say it really represents the real world data. And so most papers use this simple image data set like MNIST, Cypher 10, um, or Fashion MNIST. And due to the wide use of the image data set, most architecture used were simple CNNs. But the problem is only three of them are used pre-trained model, even though using the pre-trained model is um, more common to you know training from the scratch and aggregation method is the way to aggregate the multiple local clients model into one model parameter and most paper used fat average which is just simply averaging the um, local model parameters but there are many other methods like median, trimmed mean, or crim, which is known for its um, Byzantine failure tolerance, and scaffold, like some non-ID alleviating aggregation method, but still over 90% of work using um, fat average. And they evaluate their method in terms of efficacy, fidelity, efficiency, which are um, how well they forget and how well they remain the performance of the original model and how efficient is, is it compared to the retraining. But there are less considerations on um, security, guarantee, adaptivity, or scalability. But it, since it's the um, distributed framework, so these features will affect the availability of this method, so it has to be considered. And in terms of evaluation objective, um, papers compare the retraining, retraining from the scratch and unlearned model. There are no benchmark uh, metrics to assess different approaches, like um, let's say um, no like accuracy, let's say in terms of accuracy, the accuracy is compared between retraining, retrained model, and unlearned model. And papers use um, backdoor attack or a membership, membership inference attack, but they often rely on simple backdoor attacks. 
which could be obscured the impact of front learning because due to the you know interactive training, the attack impact would be reduced by the time. So this single page um, summing up everything. So the in the distributed nature, data are heterogeneous and this affect the model performance um, a lot, so it has to be addressed. And despite the fact that most of the paper now using um, has been used um, image data set, but you know, on the bottom line, the privacy preserving techniques is, could be used to like every other domain, like NLP task and everything. So it has to be um, experiments on that. And besides the just simply averaging the local parameter, local model parameters, it, some different use of like, a more sophisticated aggregation method could alleviate some issues. And further to the unlearning introduces the unlearned model and the original model to the participating parties. And it, the participating party could include the adversaries. So the security aspect has to be more um, um, addressed because it's easy to infer the data to be forgotten to be exposed. And the benchmark evaluation metric could enable the um, fair comparison between different approaches and more stronger or like, like long lasting or more sophisticated backdoor tests could, um, could be applied because just a simple backdoor attack could reduce the the effect of it like naturally so this just end of my presentation and the, you can see find the paper on the link there thank you thank you When you were considering right to be uh, forgotten, were any of the studies or your research considering backups in that? Because I saw servers listed and other things, but the possibility of something being restored from the backup after afterwards being a factor. Was that considered in any of this? or? Um, backup? What do you mean by backup? Uh, system backups. Uh, Oh, um, I don't think they have considered that. Okay, thank you. Uh, thanks for the talk. So are you thinking at all about adversarially attacking the forgotten model to try to re-elicit the supposedly unlearned fact? Um, it's just something we're also looking into, so I'm curious, how do you verify that it's really been forgotten? So that's yeah. by comparing the retrained model and unlearned model, so... Um, uh, sorry, let me clarify. So th that's all good and well, but the question is, can you try to jailbreak the model to discover if, if there's some latent representation of that unlearned fact still hiding in the bowels of the, the model? Does that make sense? Yes, many of the paper like use, that's why the membership inference attack is used as an evaluation metric. So if the, um, they query the model with the forgotten data and was it in the training data set or something and depending on the result of the um, attack, it could be said that it has been forgotten or not. Great, thanks. Just while, while I'm stalling, um, what do you think the right efficacy metric is? Um, so, um, I personally think the accuracy on the target data set because 
after forgetting the things, the accuracy on the target set has to be, you know, nullified or reduced almost nearly to zero. So it could be the objective metric, I guess. But when it comes to like language model or something, it could be a lot different because you know their language models could output the paraphrased um, something and everything, so it could be a lot different. So in the vision task, I would say it's the accuracy and the target. Other questions? Great, thank, thank you. you very much. Our, our Ali's going to give the, the last talk, talk of the session, and then we'll have probably the much needed time. Take it away. Uh, hi, everyone. Uh, my name is Ali Nasser. I'm a third year PhD student at UMass Amherst. I'll be presenting our paper today on uh, cylinder decoding algorithms of language models. So language models uh, have been at the heart of various, uh, various applications like machine translation, question answering, or text summarization. And uh, recent years, a large scale uh, language models arise, uh, revolutionize the field and uh, to generate diverse and high quality tech. Nowadays, you, you'll, uh, you're seeing that, you're seeing that uh, all big companies have uh, released their own uh, large language models. In this paper, specifically, we focus on open ended text generation. So first, let's uh, see, explore uh, how language models generate uh, these text. So uh, language models provide uh, property distribution at each time set over the whole vocabulary set. So given a sequence of tokens, the language model generates the next likely token in a left to right uh, fashion by applying chain rule of probability. But the question is uh, how language models can pick the best token at each time step. And that's where uh, decoding algorithms uh, come into play. So enumerating all possible output sequences for a given input uh, is not feasible due to the large uh, combinations. So they consider different types of decoding algorithms to uh, pick the best uh, token at each time step. So uh, in our paper, we considered six different decoding algorithms, which were the most popular one by that time we wrote that paper. So uh, these six uh, decoding algorithms can be categorized in two categories, uh, maximization-based methods like greedy or beam search, sampling-based methods like pure random sampling, top case sampling, nuclear sampling, and uh, sampling with temperature. Just as an example, in top case sampling, the model picks the tokens, top tokens with high uh, probability, and then we scale them to ensure that they probably sum, uh, sum up to one. And then uh, samples based on these three scale probabilities. So uh, the process of uh, choosing and tuning the decoding algorithms for different APIs is a costly operation since uh, automatic uh, metrics uh, can't reflect the quality of the uh, text and we need human evaluation for this process. Just as an example, as a real world example, you will see you can consider the company or API that uh, uh, consider these nine different configurations. Configurations means a combination of decoding algorithm and the hyperparameters. And to have a through uh, evaluation for uh, each of these configurations, we need many uh, generations, let's say 100 paragraphs for each configuration. Also, we need uh, many annotators to evaluate these uh, generated texts. If the cost for each paragraph be something around $3.5. At the end, you will see that the whole cost for fine tuning and finding the best configuration will be something around 63,000. 
Now we can ask this question, can an adversary steal the type of decoding algorithms? What about corresponding hyperparameters? And if yes, at what cost? And here is the framework of the whole, uh, the view of the whole framework. And we have two different types of probability here. So th the first one is the inner probability distribution, which is uh, provided by the language model. And the second one, we call it final probability distribution, which is the probability distribution after applying the decoding algorithm. First, let's talk about the thread model. So we are thinking about three components of the uh, thread model. The first one is the adversary's uh, capability. We assume that the attacker knows the API's language model's inner probability distribution, which is a standard uh, assumption in NLP community, and also a valid one because some of these models, like OpenAI GPT-3 or GPT-4, provides the probability of, uh, probability of top uh, tokens. And also, there are many other uh, uh, open source uh, language models that are supported by Hugging Face. You can just find or get the, uh, these probabilities. But we are considering three scenarios that the attacker can obtain the inner probability. The first one uh, is the most straightforward one when the attacker has direct access to the inner probability distribution, like as I said, the OpenAI GPT 3 and GPT 4. Uh, provides you uh, provide you uh, the, with these uh, probabilities. The second scenario is uh, when the attacker doesn't have uh, direct access to the API, so uh, the attacker uses a um, reference model as base and root the reference model to approximate the inner probabilities. And this happens um, when uh, the API uses, uh, uses uh, the pre-trained language model directly or uh, using prompt engineering instead of fine-tuning. And the third scenario and the most complicated one uh, where uh, the API uses fine-tuning uh, and in that case uh, you, you might know that the whole, uh, arc, the whole ways will be changed. So in that case we can assume that the attacker has access to a model stealing approach to mimic the target uh, model and get approximation of inner probabilities. However, model semi attack is beyond the scope of this uh, paper. The second component of threat model is the adversary's objective. So the objective is to extract the decoding algorithm and the corresponding hyperparameters. And uh, our target here uh, is GPT-2, GPT-3, and GPT-Neo, uh, which were the most popular one by that time we were uh, writing this paper. The whole intuition of our attack is that different decoding algorithms have uh, any uh, configuration has different uh, distinguishable signatures, and we will use those features and signatures uh, to um, propose a multi-stage uh, attack against these APIs. Here is an overview of uh, uh, our attack. So we have different stages, and at each stage we infer and extract different information. Just as an example, at stage 3, we want to see if the targeted API uses temperature as part of the um, uh, decoding algorithms uh, or not. So as you might know, temperature applies to the softmax uh, function. And after some uh, mathematical works, we will see that uh, we can estimate uh, temperature by using this formula. So if we have just uh, inner probability and also the final probabilities, we can estimate uh, the temperature. And this estimation also works even when um, temperature will be combined with other decoding algorithms as well. To test our attack, we um, considered three models, GPT-2, GPT-3, and gpt Neo, and different sizes of these models. And uh, we have to note that uh, we use custom um, decoding algorithms with these models instead of using a real 
uh, deployment of these uh, configurations. So uh, our final goal is to find the best decoding algorithms and hyperparameters. So if we use that configuration, we expect that uh, the stolen configuration generate the same probability distribution as the targeted one. So what we are doing here is to uh, comparing the pro two probability distributions, one from the targeted model and one from uh, the configuration we stole. To compare these two uh, distributions, we use two metrics. First one is a statistical test, which returns the p-value, and the second one is KL divergence. There's one issue with KL diver uh, divergence, which is that it just returns a single value. And at first, you have no idea what this value uh, means and how good uh, this value is. To have a better insight of uh, a good value for uh, this metric, we tried with different similar uh, configurations, also different uh, algorithms, hyperparameters. So for the same uh, configurations, we will see uh, this amount for KL divergence, which is our lower bound. And also for different configurations, we have something uh, like this 0 0.1, which is our upper bound for uh, our estimation. We have both theoretical and practical evaluation for each stage of our attack. And all of the results confirm the accuracy of our uh, estimation. Also, we conducted uh, some experiments on the case when the API uses prompt engineering um, to use the pre-trained model. And just as an example, the results for stage three to uh, estimate the temperature, we, con we considered different nine uh, configurations. And you can see the real value and also the estimated one. And the p-value equals one and low KL divergence uh, confirms uh, that uh, our attack was successful. To analyze the cost of our attack, we consider the worst case scenario of our attack. And it happens when we have to apply all six stages of our attack. So in that case, uh, we approximately need uh, this number of queries even uh, fewer than that, uh, with uh, each of them consisting of five tokens. It could be even uh, fewer than that. So with this number of queries and tokens, uh, totally we need this number of queries. And based on the pricing on uh, OpenAI, uh, just as an example, uh, we will see that the total cost for our attack for different uh, models, sizes of GP3 is this. And these numbers were from the time we wrote this paper and currently I think they are even lower than that. Just compare these numbers with the uh, cost we needed to, uh, to find the best configuration. Since our attack strongly relies on the accuracy of API's uh, distribution, probability distribution, any change or modification of these probabilities will lead to uh, different estimation. So a simple uh, defense could be adding small noise to generation. So at inference time with probability of 0 0.1, we replace the selected token with some other high probability token. We do that to minimize the performance impact. I mean, replacing with a token with a high probability. And as you can see that we tried with uh, different uh, configurations and the new estimation will be different from the real values. And also um, the low p-value confirms that the attack uh, is not successful. And also we use perplexity as a metric to show that uh, this defense doesn't hurt uh, the performance of, uh, of the language model.
So one of the limitations of our attack is that we assume that the uh, um, uh, base model we use to approximate the inner probability should be the same type of the targeted one. However, it's feasible to detect what kind of uh, language model is used in an API. Since uh, we have a limited number of uh, large language models, popular one, and uh, also they have different behavior in their generation. So by doing some simple experiments, we can infer which type of uh, pre-trained model was used. So as future work, we can think about different aspects of privacy and security of uh, different components of language model, specifically decoding strategies. And also we can uh, think about the weaknesses of the newest ones. So each of these decoding algorithms have their own uh, weaknesses. So we, you will see that uh, the new decoding algor algorithms will be proposed every day. So think about how we want to do the same attack against those decoding algorithms will be something we can do in the future. And uh, as I mentioned once in uh, this presentation, uh, one of the things was the model extraction thing. Also, model extraction attacks against um, language models in open-ended text generation is a challenge that I haven't seen anyone has done it before. Thank you. I do. Uh, hi. Thank you for the talk. Just one thing. I want to make sure I understand this correctly. So you you basically democratize the process of attacking the decoder model of companies like OpenAI to recover cheaply how they are actually mapping the tokens to the generated text? Yeah. OK, I'm tempted to ask why. What's, what's the value of a, of a model like that besides stealing IP? So. As I mentioned in my, uh, in one of the, that's a very good question. So in um, one of the examples I provided here, this, the whole process for, for an API, the whole process to find the best configuration as a decoding algorithm and also the hyperparameters is a costly operation. So these companies do it with thousands of dollars to find the best one. And we show that uh, we can steal and infer those values with a uh, cheap process. So, so a follow on to that with my stealth model. Uh, so I, I guess a follow on for that is if I have my own model, is a decoding algorithm likely to transfer? Or can I learn something from somebody else's decoding algorithm? Yes? Yes. Okay. So, what utility does it have to me to recover your decoding algorithm? So, um, the point is that if if you uh, if you know that the base model these uh, APIs uses, so if you have both the model and also the decoding algorithm, it means that you have a whole API. We can consider each of these uh, language model based API as two components: language model, decoding algorithm. Other questions? Okay, great. Let's let's say thank you to all the speakers.